prove it does. It just means you could explain it that way. When the Muslim says, how do you know someone died for your sins? And the answer comes back, someone has to because, etc., etc., etc. God is here, man is there, and we have to pay this debt, and so on and so forth. That's an explanation. That's not a proof it ever happened, or will happen, or whatever. That's an explanation of how it works. And an explanation is not a proof. It's fascinating to dwell on those explanations, and sometimes they do that. Fascinating because virtually all of these explanations are built on analogies, and the analogies are virtually always faulty in the first place. That is, people don't usually even explain things directly. They usually will tell you, well, it's like this, and he tells you about something else. And now he has two problems. He's got to explain this thing, and then show you that this thing is really like the other thing to explain to you that the redemption of man is like a traffic court judge who pays the fines of all the guilty parties is a faulty analogy, for example. Because the traffic court judge is not the offended party. The state is offended, and the state does not forgive when the state fines someone. Whoever pays the fines is beside the point. Uh, just to cite uh, one example of a common analogy. But anyway, as I mentioned, the real complaint of the Quran is the, the handling of scripture. So, Maybe one of the most important questions that the Muslim would want to stress for those who are discussing the gospel and trying to uh, show someone the meaning they have discovered, the important question might be to urge a person to ask himself, did you discover that meaning in the scriptures? Or did you invent that meaning? And then prop it up with what you found in the scripture. It's a, an old uh, problem uh, mathematicians have talked about for at least 26 centuries. To say, do we discover mathematics or do we invent it? It's not entirely clear because we make up some rules, we work with it, and then we say, look what I found, but no, you invented it in the first place, or did you find it? It's a, a delicate kind of a thought, and it's worth examining in the same way. If someone says, look what I found, the scripture tells me such and such, it may well be that's a discovery, but possibly it was a preconceived idea that now fits what is read. Of course, the Bible has been read in a great many different ways. A great deal of emphasis is placed by some on the crucifixion as being the salvation of man. Yet according to the 19th chapter of Luke, Jesus told the certain Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to your house. He didn't say, next week when I die, that will be when salvation comes. He says, today salvation, whatever that means, is coming to your house. <coughs> Rather easy to read that and think maybe the crucifixion is not, not quite what somebody told me it was. It's a possibility. The 14th chapter of John has been uh, quoted by, well, there's usually two favorite verses in there, but the whole thing put in its context doesn't read quite the way a lot of people tell it. That is, um, on the one hand, uh, Jesus says, no one comes to the Father but through me, and it is often... Uh, quoted in order to establish some kind of an idea that if man is reaching for God, you've got to talk to Jesus first or, or go through him or whatever. When put back in its context, the whole subject of that chapter is not so much man reaching for God, but God reaching for man. That Jesus says, I came to show you God. Philip said, show us the Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He didn't seem to be claiming divinity because in the first place he's supposed to be the Son, not the Father. Uh, and in the fifth chapter of John, he said, no one's ever seen the Father. But my point is here that um, I'm not going to try to reinterpret the, the Bible. I'm just trying to show that it sometimes just as easily reads in quite a different way than the exclusive way that some have tried to put on it. It is not, and that's a more recent development, I suppose, it is not the Muslim's job to try to reinterpret the Bible. Uh, there's plenty of people busy doing that. Uh, there's plenty of cultists who will tell you they have found everything in there from flying saucers to word processors. Uh, it's not the Muslim's job to find some novel twist on the meaning. It's merely his job to remind an individual that if you are sure about what it says, ask yourself again, did you have that in your mind before, or did you really discover it? This means an encouragement to think. And there are different views on that subject as to whether that's a good idea to think or not. There are 
in a sense, two streams of Christianity. And the Muslim, is, uh, as a foreign student, is usually quite uh, confused because he never thought about that before. He comes to this country and turns on the television one Sunday morning, and after a few minutes, says, well, that must be Christianity. He'd never seen a Christian before in his life, possibly. And certainly in the minds of those people speaking, they have Christianity. But what the Muslim is sometimes unaware of, he may spend some years in the country and never catch on to the fact that there's a lot of people who call themselves Christian and they have nothing to do with what you saw on television Sunday morning. There are widely uh, different views. And one of the things that divides these streams concerns an understanding of the term lost. What does it mean when somebody's lost? Does it mean that he isn't saved, or does it mean something else? You might ask the question this way, is an explorer lost? If a man is going into a land where no one has ever been before, is he lost? Well, one branch of Christianity would tend to say yes, and another branch would say no, he's an explorer, he's not lost, he's exploring the territory. The problem the Muslim has is not with a man who will tell you explorers are not lost. He has a problem with a man who tells you, yes, until you find what you're looking for, you're lost. That stream of Christianity is the one that gives him the problem, because that is the stream of Christianity that um, does an awful lot of study and preparation, but does not encourage a reinvestigation, an objective investigation of things. As an example, I suppose that the key question of the, the test question to all Muslims, uh, as it is put to them by those who are anxious to bring them into the fold, uh, they want a yes or no answer to the question, is Jesus divine? Is he divine? Yes or no? Which skips a very important matter. The question is, what is that supposed to mean? Is he divine? Yes or no? What do you mean, is he divine? was uh, Spinoza a few hundred years ago, who was a Jew, at least by uh, heritage, and he withdrew from the Jewish community. He was quite a philosopher and felt alienated from the community. And there were Christians who came to him and said, now, of course, that you have left the Jews, you will be a Christian. And he said, maybe I will, when I understand what you're talking about. And his main thing was just that, to stick to the definition, to say, I hear the words, but I don't know what they mean. You tell me God became man. What do you mean? Like my father became dead or like ice became water? Do you mean once there was God and he squeezed himself down, now he's a man, he used to be God, or what do you mean? The words sound like one thing, but the actual definition is pretty hard to uh, explain, if it ever has been explained. As a matter of fact, the insistence on the humanity and the divinity of Jesus is a puzzling thing for the Muslim. It's not trying to be a, a, a smart aleck. He's trying to ask simple, childlike questions of what is that supposed to mean? Because on the one hand, he's told God is 100% holy. That's why God can't deal with sinful man. Man is sinful. He's down here. And God is 100% holy. So we need a mediator. And the Muslim asks, how holy is the mediator? 50%? 51%? And the answer, no, no, he's 100% holy, he's God. Well, then we still have this problem. If the problem is that God, because of his holiness, can't deal directly with man, you haven't really put anybody in the middle if he's still God. Again, it is said, God can't deal with the sinners. And yet Jesus used to eat with them, according to the Bible. It didn't seem to annoy him to get that close to a sinner. My main point is this, however, as the title was announced, what does the gospel mean to Muslims? To the Muslim who has uh, investigated and studied it, and it has been a topic among Muslims for hundreds of years, the Muslim does not really expect in the first place that the gospel, the message of Jesus, contains any theology in the first place. There is a verse that's often quoted from the Quran.